Is it important? It's very crucial. Groovy. Little step. I'll say kick it, and you'll just kick it with a tasty groove, okay? One, two, three, kick it. Woo! Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> oh, he likes. It's time for the most crucial podcast with your host, me, Mark Franchise. Meh, meh, meh. All right, welcome back to the most crucial podcast. It's Mark Franchise with 1049 The Edge. Joined once again uh, with my dude, Keith Howland, the guitar player for Chicago. Thanks for hanging out with me again, man. Appreciate it. It's good to be here. Awesome, How dude. Oh, dude, everything's great, man. The last time we talked to you, seven months to the day since you guys wrapped up your uh, back-to-back shows at the Ravinia in uh, Highland Park. Oh, yeah. I think the tour was kicking off in Chicago on the 10th and, uh, of August. I've probably seen Chicago more than any other band live. I was just blown away again. Uh, Just, I mean, that was easily the best show I've ever seen Chicago perform. It was incredible. Wow. We must have have had a good night. I don't remember. Oh, man. (laughs) It was fantastic. Well, the the cool thing about it for me was I had never been to the Ravinia before, and this was also kind of my first time just going to Chicago by myself to see a show uh, because like I said, I grew up on the east side of Michigan and I've been living in Kalamazoo since 2017. So this was a fun opportunity for me to you know, just kind of go out and do something new. And that venue is so unique. I've never been to a place like that before. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't know. It was it was crazy. Like, people had tables and catering set up and I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of more of a wine and cheese crowd in a way, you know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was unique. It was kind of a fun vibe. Yeah, it was cool. They it, it, they had, uh, if you've never been there before, it's like people are allowed to bring chairs and coolers and they set tables up and then they have these huge screens where you can watch a show on. And I was actually posted up right on the bar that separated the pavilion from, I guess, what you would consider the lawn. But because of the layout, there really isn't lawn seating. It's more of just kind of a more relaxed setting where people just hang out. They, you know, they can watch the the show on the screen, but unless you're right up on that bar, you're not really seeing too much of the stage. But uh, that was just such a unique show that you guys brought. Not only musically, the production of it all was was wild. It's almost like every song had its own lighting set up, and it it was super unique. Yeah, well, we're still carrying all that with the with the big screens behind us with all the content, and you know, so it's there's still a lot of visual things happening along with the uh, with the music. You know, we're not, not doing too much different a show than probably probably the one you saw last year. A couple of little tweaks here and there, but uh, it's still a, a two-set show with uh, practically every hit the band has ever had. It's well over two hours of music. Yeah, we're, you know, we're committed. We're committed to delivering the goods. Well, and that's the cool thing, too, is we had touched on before. Chicago is an evolving band, and I think that was probably one of the things that not necessarily caught me off guard, but one thing that really stood stood out about that show is just the continuity between everybody in the band. When you have a lot of people on stage, you know, you can almost <laughs> kind of set yourself up for disaster. You guys didn't miss a beat. It was unbelievable. Well, you know, to speak to that, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the most precarious onstage situation I can say that we've ever had was uh, when we toured with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And when we did the encore together, we had, I think, 23 people on stage. <laughs> you, you know, so it was both bands. And, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, they're dancing and moving and they're going around and we were moving around. Yeah. And nobody tripped over one another and <laughs> nobody ran into each other. And, so if we can handle that, you know, we can handle 10 guys easy. <laughs> yeah. Guys. How, many, how many guys do we have now? Nine? Nine. <laughs> Nine. That's wild. I've, lo- I've lost count over the years. <laughs> I just know that we now have three tour buses because... We can't fit everybody on two. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> I know. I think I did see that show, actually. That was, uh, gosh, maybe 2014 or something. That was on the east side when, we, when you guys played uh, DT Energy Music Theater. One of my one of my favorite places to play, by the way, Pine Knob. Oh, yeah. I don't know. There's something about that venue, too, just going to see a show there. it's it's There's something special about it. I've, like I said, grew up you know, maybe 20 minutes away from the venue. And uh, yeah, I always love going there. And it always sounds great. I don't know how it sounds for you guys on stage, but sounds great. yeah, I, I think Chicago actually recorded a live album in 93 from Pine Knob, if I'm not mistaken, if I got the year right. I yep. kind of think I stumbled and across I believe, it. 
I believe back in back in the early seventies, I want to say right after the place. I, I'm not sure if it was right when they opened, but Chicago did eight shows in seven days, all sold out in the seventies. Wow! So they did they did a Saturday matinee show. So they played an entire week with two shows on Saturday, all sold out. Jeez, that's fine now. <laughs> that's yeah. insane. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I, I was not there. <laughs> right. I was, I was still uh, I was still practicing my guitar in my parents' house. <laughs> You're working your way up. Well, right. we were talking last time you were you had alluded to new material that you guys were working on, and then it was revealed shortly after that show that you guys were um, working on a Christmas album, which I was really excited for. That was. Highly unexpected. I wasn't expecting a Christmas album. Again, it was a it was a great listen. Uh, that was like perfect timing, <laughs> right in time for the holidays. Yeah, and you know what's kind of cool about it is, is if you don't really, um, if you're not a lyrics kind of person, if you're not really paying attention to what the lyrics are, and you're just listening to music, I mean, there's a lot of original material on that record that's, you know, could be construed as pop tunes, you know. Yeah. It's, it's a Chicago album, and it's, Jimmy's horn arrangements, and it's it's uh, there's a lot of really great stuff on there, and great performances, and uh, you know, with the exception of uh, I think there were maybe three or four traditional arrangements of Christmas tunes, and then everything else was was all original music. So um, yeah, that was the difference between that Christmas album and the ones we've done previously, which were almost all you know just arrangements of old traditional Christmas song. Yeah, true. Uh, and it, it, it was kind of exciting, too, because regardless of whether it's Christmas themed or not, like you said, it's it's new music. So anybody who's a, a fan of Chicago is a fan of the arrangements and and the music and the lyrics, the whole package. So for me, it was like, well, awesome this is basically like a new Chicago album and it's Christmas time. So it's going to put me in the mood. It was a lot of fun too. And there was a, I believe there was a behind the scenes video that kind of showed how you recorded because you guys were recording a lot of that stuff on the tour bus or writing it, weren't you? Well, you know, the way we kind of did it, um, which was a little bit different than we, the, the way we did uh, Chicago 36, which was also quote unquote, quote, recorded on the road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But Chicago 36 was a little bit different because just it was just sort of the mechanics of how it, it went about. It was still recorded on the road, but when we did this Christmas album, um, we actually did go down uh, to the gigs early, and we would track the rhythm section live for each of these tunes. So it was usually huh. uh, myself, Brett on bass, and Wally on drums, and Robert and... Uh, Lou on keyboards, and the five of us, and sometimes uh, even Ray, the percussionist, uh, would play. So basically, we had you know five or six guys all cutting together, together, much like the band did in the seventies. You know, you go in the studio and you just track live, yeah, and capture a performance. Um, Chicago Thirty Six was a little bit more one guy at a time kind of recording. Okay, you know. Um, so I kind of enjoyed this more because I kind of like the spontaneity of what you get out of a you know a live performance of a rhythm section. No so doubt. We, and usually we had the tune within like three takes. That's pretty we good. With charts, and we sat down and we, we cut it, and um, they had the Pro Tools rig set up right there, and we recorded it, and then uh, you know, and then much like making any record, the the vocals and the horns were overdubbed and hotel ballrooms or on the tour bus, you know, wherever we could do it. And uh, I did a few additional guitars um, in my hotel room with my little portable rig. And uh, But really, it was really, to say it was recorded on the road, but it was recorded very much like all the early Chicago records were, you know, capturing a performance of the rhythm section and then, you know, adding the uh, sweetening, doing the vocals and the horns. Yeah. On top. 
It's cool too, you know, with that video and they're showing, you know, little behind the scenes clips of how they're arranging and, and, and seeing that writing process. It's just something about that is super cool to see guys coming together uh, of the evolution of Chicago. And then, you know, you got the horn section who's been doing this, you know, basically their entire lives. It really comes through on the album. Honestly, it's a, it's a lot of fun and uh, it was sweet. That, that's definitely, um, if I would have sort of put my finger on one thing, you know, that's happened with me in this group that, that you know, kind of was mind-blowing was, like, kind of the first time I saw, and, and this actually was back uh, when Walt Parasader was still here as well. Okay. So it was the original three guys in the studio doing horn arrangements and watching them work and bouncing things off of each other and, you know, just sort of watching Jimmy kind of work his magic and then seeing the other guys pitch in and, you know, or wait a minute, am I supposed to be at, uh, you know, a B-flat here? Or should I, oh, wait a minute, they'll bring that down to a, you know, you go under and you play this note, and then, hey, Walt, what do you think? Well, okay, you go up here. Okay, you know, take the eraser out and rewrite the chart and changing the voicings and just watching how they, how easily they maneuvered the arrangements in the studio and, and, and sort of the genius that Jimmy brings to the arrangement side of things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so it was kind of, that was really early on. That was one of the things that, like, I think it was, might even have been the first Christmas album we did in the 90s. Okay. I remember being in the studio and just kind of going like, wow, this is, this is a fly on the wall moment, you know, that you don't get to see, that most people don't get to see. Oh yeah, no doubt. Because you're recording with them, but then at the same time you see something like that and you're like almost taken back to like when you were a fan and going, oh my God, this is amazing. Oh my God. I'm in this band, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. It was it's a really cool. Those guys just, you know, uh, they've been doing it for 53 years, probably a little bit more. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's just uh, second nature to them. I mean, I've seen Jimmy sit on an airplane and write a horn chart without even having a, a keyboard or a horn in his hand. Wow. You know, just out of his head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, no, I can't do that. <laughs> That's pretty wild. I'm not really a big music reader. I can read a, a, a chord chart, but uh, put notes in front of me, and that's when I turn my guitar down. <laughs> that's funny. That was such a, uh, a cool experience being able to meet you guys last year. It's wild. You just listen to this music your entire life. You, you grew up on it. To have these guys who have made such an influence in your life right there in front of you, you know, I don't normally get too shy around people i you know i'm a pretty outgoing person but it was kind of one of those experiences where it was just man i was just glad i got to actually meet you guys and and thank you in person for uh for that music and for the entertainment because like i said the a chicago show is really unlike anything else and it's really a, a unique experience and a special thing too that you know after all these years we still get to see such a top-notch performance for our uh from world-class musicians well you know we're trying Trying to bring the bring the goods every night. And, you know, that's one thing I I will say about this band. And, and uh, even on our worst night, and and this is not being arrogant; it's just being honest. And that is, is that you know, even if we have kind of an off night, yeah, you know, we're like ninety two percent there. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and every every once in a while, you'll have one of those nights where maybe more than one guy is slightly off his game. And so we'll kind of come off and be like, yeah, that wasn't quite, you know, but the consistency of the musicianship in this group is really, really solid. Oh, yeah. I'd like to say. Yeah, absolutely. The between a, a bad show and a great show is very negligible, and usually the audience can't tell the difference. It's more, more us, where you just kind of feel it. It's like, okay, it's not quite, maybe the room doesn't sound quite right, or, you know, something's a little awry in your mix and it just kind of throws you off or whatever but you know like I said I've been around a lot of different bands and, and this is by far one of the most consistent you know, some bands will go way out on a limb to try to get performances that are sort of transcendent of something that they've you know tried to accomplish and then on some nights will like fail miserably because they're going or something outside their comfort zone. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you may see a show one day and you're like, wow, they really weren't on. And then the next day you'll see them again 
and and it's like, wow, what a mind blowing performance. Whereas I think we're like, you know, we're going to give you, you know, if you come see us, it's going to be great, and that's that's it. That kind of stuff too is it, it depends on you know obviously what kind of night you you guys are having, but the audience is has a completely different perspective of the whole thing so like you said that kind of stuff they may not even notice but as a musician you know you look out for certain things and that's really that's going to happen that's bound to happen it's just about bouncing back and working through it and luckily you've got the right people in your corner to you know everybody's got each other's back so well yeah and when you when you have nine guys on stage you know if you're a trio you know that's three guys you know? yeah so one guy having a bad night in a, in a, in a three piece and that's going to throw a big monkey wrench in. But when you got nine guys, that that always kind of carries the thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So you guys are coming up. This is your first show of the last leg of your um, Las Vegas residency, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, you were. How long have you been out there for? Was it a four week run? Three weeks. Okay. Three weeks. Yeah. How's it? Uh, how's it but, performing at the uh, Venetian? Oh, it's a beautiful theater. Is it okay? Yeah, it's a real ornate kind of. They really did a nice job in there, and it sounds amazing. Really, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice size. I think it's about probably three thousand people, so we're really not a bad seat in the house, and uh, sounds sounds great. Yeah, for us and the audience, um, stage sounds great too. So you know, if you're going to be stuck in one place, might not be somewhere where, where it sounds great and looks great, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, been, it's been good. We've been, uh, I think we've been pretty much sold out the whole time. That's great news. Yeah. And this is basically gearing up for your 2020 tour, right? Yeah, we're actually hitting the road this summer with my my first boss, Mr. Rick Springfield, <laughs> um, opening for us. And Rick was, my first tour uh, as a guitar player was in 1992-93 with Rick. Yeah. And uh, so it's kind of a full circle moment for me. Going to be fun. Yeah, when I saw that, <laughs> when I saw that, I was laughing. I was like, I wonder if Keith's going to get up there on stage with him and play. <laughs> well, we haven't talked about it yet, but you never know, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought that um, was interesting. <laughs> I do, I do know that he is still going to call me new guy because he never did refer <laughs> me by my by my real name. Uh, I, I was only the new guy, so. <laughs> When I when I texted him and I said, "Hey Rick, we're going on the Rick road," he said, well, "That's great news, new guy." <laughs> you know, I'm kind of an old guy now. I'm really not new guy anymore. But okay. Oh man! At least you remembered you. <laughs> that's true. No, we kept in touch over the years. That's good. So, uh, yeah, he's he, he's a great guy, and, and I think a lot of people. You know, at first blush, they see Rick Springfield in Chicago, and they go, that seems like an odd pairing, perhaps. Um, but if you really dig into Rick's music, and I think a lot of people are unaware of the number of hits that, that he had and how huge he was in the 80s, um, I really think it's going to I think it's gonna work. I think, the, I think our audience is going to get him, and it's going to get us. Yeah. So... And he is a great performer. I mean, right now, I saw him about a year ago, um, and I don't think anything's changed in his camp. The band is slamming, and he is, the guy, I think he just turned 70 years old. Wow. And he's got more energy than most 20-somethings I see. I will always suggest to people, like, checking out new music, and like, as I said, that's a lot of what the what this podcast is hopefully turning people on to new musicians and, and new music too, because just going out and discovering new stuff can lead to some incredible experiences. A uh, couple months ago, I went and I, uh, I went and saw AJ Croce who was playing a, a little, a little theater and AJ is the son of uh, Jim Croce. And we had talked a little bit before the show and we were going to watch him play and he's introducing his band and he introduces his drummer, uh, Gary Malibur. And I kind oh, of, God. I was like, what? And I'm like, no, because my, my first introduction to Gary Malibur was a uh, live album from Steve Miller Band. From It was the King Biscuit Flower Hour. And um, oh, yeah. Steve Miller did two live albums. I think they're a year or two separate but gary's on one of those albums and that was my one of, that was my introduction to steve miller so i've followed 
Gary Malibur's drumming through, you know, his career. And I had no idea. And I was, I was kind of sitting there for a minute going, is that seriously him? And yeah, sure enough, it was him. And then after the show, he hung out with us for like two hours and just BS with us. And it was un it was unreal. I couldn't believe, <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't, I was just so shocked that, you know, you, I had an experience like this. Like I was already lucky enough to talk to AJ for a little bit. And then, you know, here's one of my favorite drummers just hanging out, <laughs> you know, I unbelievable. I feel like I met, I feel like I met Gary. Um, I think he was playing with Bonnie Waite at the time. Okay. And we did, we did some corporate together and yeah, it was kind of cool to meet him because, uh, you know, I had, I had fly like an eagle when I was a kid. I always loved the drumming on that record. And, yeah. And that was Gary. Um, yeah, he's, he's a unique player and he's, he's, he's brilliant. That great. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty wild. He was a super cool dude. He is currently touring with AJ. I believe he's actually on his uh, upcoming album as well. So Is AJ's stuff much like his father's? or is it? You know, it's strange. He's got such a unique style in his own right. It's very jazzy, very bluesy. He's got a kind of like a raspy tone in his voice. Really good singer. But, you know, I was surprised because he was playing Croce Plays Croce. That was the name of the tour. He was telling me that, you know, he grew up on the same music his father grew up on because he inherited his father's record collection. So they both listened to the same thing growing up. So, so it was interesting because he had chosen songs to play that were special to him that were special to his father and then special to both of them. Uh, so they, they had some unique covers that they played, but he, I mean, him and his band did a fantastic job uh, playing his father's music. I was blown away. I couldn't believe how well he was able to just really perform the songs and make them, make them his own, but at the same time doing his father tremendous justice for sure. Yeah. His, his music's really easy to listen to because it's, it's very like lounge like almost, but Again, every album is a little bit different than the other one. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, he's a cool I kid. Heard, I haven't heard any of it. I didn't even know this stuff existed. Yeah. So I'll, you turn me on to something new, I'll, I'll check it out. Awesome. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He's, I'm, like I said, it, the band was, uh, who was it? He, he had uh, Dr. John's bass player was also playing with him. Wow. So it was, it was a while. It was really, it was just a four-piece. Uh, they just did a fantastic job with the Jim Croce songs and then also the uh, the covers that they had they had chosen to play as well. Yeah, it was interesting. But I, yeah, I really like AJ's music. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, I know, right? There's so, that's the beauty of music is there's always something new to discover. And yeah, I, I've always tried to keep my mind wide open. <laughs> How is everything with, because obviously sending out on tour, and as of today, um, March 11th, coronavirus is just going insane right now. Uh, it's causing the NCAA just announced they're going to be doing crowdless March Madness. Like basically only family and school are going to be allowed there. And has that affected any of your future plans? Not so far. Um, and, you know, I know these guys, um, unless something mandated comes down that we, we can't perform, um, you know, from the CDC or, 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 or otherwise, uh, we'll continue to perform. Cool. I mean, that's, that's, uh, I don't think anybody over here is going to make a voluntary decision to not do it. We're, we'll, we'll, we'll stay out there and keep doing what we do until somebody tells us to stop. That's just the work ethic of this band. Yeah. We, we, uh, you know, when nine 11 happened, we, we just kept playing. We thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of bands and a lot of artists canceled, uh, you know, right after 9-11. And, and I think we were on stage the very next night. Wow. And I remember Jimmy Jimmy basically said, you know, we, we all got together, we talked about it, and we thought that, you know, the power of music and a distraction is what you need right now, and not us not being here. And the crowd went bananas, and we had a great show, and everybody left happy, or at least, at least distracted, you know, for a couple hours. So, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep plugging until uh, somebody unplugs us. Gotcha. That's great. Yeah, it's tough, especially when things like this happen, because I know serious of an issue it is as it is. I've always kind of viewed life like, dude, just you're worrying about something that isn't even a part of your life. It's 
being told to you and it's out there and it's real, but it's not a part of your life. You don't have it. You're and and everybody worries and they, they live in paranoia and they live in fear. And it's I just try not to live like that. I try not to worry about things until there's a reason to actually worry about them. And yep, but I totally agree with you. But, you know, I get it. I get, I get why people are trying to be safe with it and trying to be as safe as possible. But, uh, well, that's good to hear that you guys are going to be playing. You're going to play in uh, Fire Keepers Thursday, April 9th, right? I believe that is correct. Cool. Yeah, that's going to be a fun one in uh, Battle Creek. That's why I was excited because I was like, oh, man, they're playing Battle Creek. That's insane. The uh, the Rock Station, the, our sister station uh, over at Town Square Media, they had their birthday show. The Doobies played there. And it's a, it's a great theater if you've never played there before. I don't remember if we have or not. Uh, you know, they all kind of run together after a while. Yeah, for Obviously, sure. <laughs> you, remember, you remember the uh, Red Rocks and the Pine Knob and the, you know, the Starplex in Dallas. But some of these gigs, um, until I walk in the building and then I go, oh, yeah, I remember this. Right. <laughs> I see it on the schedule. And I go, yeah, I don't remember that. And then I go get there and I go, oh, yeah, I remember this gig. I remember this backstage. I remember this catering. <laughs> right. Is that an indoor gig or an outdoor gig? That's going to be indoor. Yeah, it's like it's right okay. in it's right in the casino. It's basically almost like a giant auditorium almost, and then there's bleachers in the back. So there really isn't okay. a a bad seat in the house, but it could. Uh, yeah, it, it can fit a lot of people in there. It was bigger than I expected. Cool. So. Yeah, that's. Oh, I look forward to it. Yeah, that'll be a fun show for sure. Do you guys have any uh, plans after the tour this year? Or are you, as uh, I know, Chicago likes to stay busy. <laughs> I was going to say, what, when is after the tour? <laughs> right. We're on tour for the. We're on tour for like the remainder of the year. I don't know, uh, I don't know when after is. Maybe November, December. Right. Um, probably like family vacations and uh, you know, reacquainting myself with my kids. You know, yeah, we're looking forward to the show in in Battle Creek here, and uh, definitely looking forward to more music uh, from you guys and and more live performances too. It's a, like I said, it's a special thing that we still get to uh, continue to see live music of that caliber, especially <laughs> so much of it as well. Oh, well, awesome! Well, it's great talking to you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. I got to jump in the shower and get ready to do a show. Awesome, dude. Well, you have a great time tonight. Thanks again for taking some time out for me. I appreciate it. Okay, great talking to you.